Okay, so today we're talking about greenhouses in Alberta. We're the fourth largest industry in the country, and we are growing uh, by leaps and bounds. But what are some of the challenges that come along with it? Our expert today will give us their thoughts and what they've seen over the history of their business. So Eric Just is a second generation partner of Just Greenhouses, an 11 acre operation in Lacombe County. His family operation uses lighting and a high wire system, specialized in cucumbers and peppers, as well as growing tomatoes, eggplants, and lettuce. Diff has long been on the leading edge of good greenhouse management, first with pioneering supplemental light for winter production of their various crops, as well as plant management techniques such as intercropping, applying lean, ma lean management principles, and cutting costs with integrated energy management. Eric is a clear leader in the industry and is generous in sharing his knowledge with other growers, as well as promoting the Alberta greenhouse industry. And so without further ado, I will turn it over to Eric. Thanks, Dustin. Welcome, everybody. I just have a PowerPoint presentation here I can go through. It's about 40 slides or so. And I can answer questions at the end if there are any. Um, maybe just jot them down or keep track of them as we go along. Um, and I'll go through the slides and uh, that might be the easiest way to go. Our location, we're in central Alberta. My dad started up our company over 40 years ago. And uh, we're just east of Gull Lake, uh, about 10 minutes off the QE2. Most of our products end up in the capital region of Edmonton and area and central Alberta. This is a, an old picture of when my dad first started. He immigrated from Holland when he was uh, single and 19. Um, and this was on some rented land from one of his uncles who was here in Canada. And he started a small greenhouse there. It was a bit of a hobby farm. Uh, wood frame. This is our current location uh, today that we're still on. It's the site of our phase three. Uh, this was an original greenhouse back in the day. You can see in the very back corner there. I don't know if you can see my Dustin. Can you see my mouse running around? Yes, okay. I can. Okay, good. I'll use that as a pointer. Uh, so yeah, the back corner there, you could see uh, there was some snow load and ice that uh, collapsed one of the roofs. And uh, that's one of the challenges we had to deal with back then. So we replaced that wood structure after a few years uh, to a hoop house, metal structure, connected gutters, uh, forced venting on the sides. Uh, so the roofs didn't open at all. This was back in the, uh, in the 80s. And we had a couple small expansions on the back end as we went along. And here you can see we're preparing the site for uh, another expansion. This was a uh, natural gas boiler. We never uh, burned coal or wood. Uh, is uh, yeah, natural gas the whole way through up until this point today. So another four bays on the back end of the greenhouse here. Uh, this was basically cucumbers, so a bit of tomatoes in the beginning as well. Another shot of the greenhouse with our dairy farmer neighbor to the north of us. It's my dad back in the day. I'm not sure how old he was, but those are uh, some quality cucumbers. We were one of the, maybe the first uh, Long English cucumber grower. One of the first. I know there was some in Medicine Hat area as well. Um, but yeah, long English uh, growing indoors in a greenhouse was a fairly new concept back then. This is the site of our current phase one. This is our uh, loading dock area, header house. So our boilers are in there. You can see back there, we still had our old structures down below. Those are gone now and we built up the site to make it all uh, level. So this is us uh, putting up the poles for, for phase three. This was in 2001. And this was our six acre facility. We had three blocks of two acres here. They're all connected. Uh, this was back in uh, probably mid 2000s. You can see our surface ponds here. We collect all of our water from local uh, quarter sections in the spring. So we rely heavily on spring runoff and um, snow and rain from the roofs. We collect it all and it goes back into our surface ponds. 
And this is our facility as it is today. It's a little bit blurry, but uh, we added five acres of glass greenhouses in the back. Uh, they're diffused glass and uh, they're connected through our current phase one to get back there. So we basically have four different uh, growing areas, phase one, two, three, and then this is, we call it phase five and six, but it's basically one climate area. So we, right now we have cucumbers and mini cucumbers in the back. We have uh, non-lit, so traditional peppers in this phase. Phase two right now is tomatoes, it's lit, winter production. And phase three is lit as well. And we have winter peppers in there. So we're currently producing in the, most of our area. We gear up our whole production cycle in the winter with our lighting program. I'll talk a bit more about our lights as we go here. Um, we uh, first installed our, our lights. The first phase three right here was uh, about eight years ago. And we started with cucumbers and now uh, we have multiple different crops under lights. Uh, peppers, tomatoes, lettuce, and uh, long and short cucumbers. Uh, marketing channels. My parents uh, have always believed in uh, direct marketing and it's still something we believe in today, uh, every Saturday and a couple markets during the week we're at, uh, mainly in the capital region of Edmonton. Our products end up in uh, different markets across Alberta as well. So this was uh, back in the early 80s in Lacombe, uh, one of the original farmer's markets. This might have been Red Deer actually, um, one of the original farmer's markets in Alberta. This was back in 2004, we were at Mill Woods, a simple setup. St. Albert in 04, we have different setups along the way. So our main mark, farmer's market uh, is at Strathcona, Old Strathcona, just off of White Ave in Edmonton every Saturday. And we have a permanent stall there, we're there uh, year round. Uh, this is our current St. Albert setup in the summer. So three tents. And this is a downtown Edmonton market, city market on 104th Street. So I think it's one of the oldest markets in uh, Canada. And uh, it got voted one, I think the best market in North America a few years ago. It's a great atmosphere. Uh, our product also ends up in uh, about 35 or 40 local stores in central Alberta through the name Pick and Pack Produce. We're partners with uh, another local greenhouse in, here in central Alberta, Gull Valley Greenhouses, the Teamster family. And a lot of our bulk items, like uh, we mainly grow cucumbers and most of those cucumbers end up through Sunfresh Farms in Edmonton. We're partners with four other farmers in Sunfresh Farms and uh, uh, they handle uh, a lot of those products up there. Products we currently grow, I'll run through some photos here. Uh, large uh, purple eggplant, we also have a few striped ones. Uh, different colors of bell peppers. Uh, small tomatoes, um, we have some tomatoes on the vine and beefsteak as well. This is our lettuce area. So um, you can see we have LED lights installed here. It's about 500 square meters. And uh, we have three types of lettuce we're growing now. We have the butter leaf, we have oak leaf here, three different seeds in one block, and then we have romaine on the edge there. Um, so this is a starter pond on the left-hand side. We grow them from seed. It's uh, twice the density of our finishing pond. So these are all just styrofoam floats uh, on about a foot and a half of water. Uh, we got this system out of Holland, and before the uh, roots are too big, they don't connect with the pond underneath, so we have to overhead irrigate in the beginning pond here. And then when they get too big at the end, we transfer them over to the finishing pond and they float to the front. And then we harvest them off the front end. So uh, this lettuce area is mainly for our farmer's markets. We sell to uh, directly to some restaurants as well in Edmonton area. And we're seeing that trend uh, get, get bigger, uh, more and more chefs and uh, Families want to connect with us directly. Um, product is fresher, lasts longer for them, and uh, they like knowing where their food comes from. So that's uh, uh, that's a joy of growing uh, and using and selling our products in 
direct ways with uh, connecting with con with customers, and they can provide us really good feedback as well. Uh, mini cucumbers and long English cucumbers. Currently, they're in our glass house in the back. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we're expanding our cucumber area this spring and summer. We're going to grow a bit more in a certain different in a different area as well. I'll mention about our heating and irrigation systems. So this is our current boiler. It's about 900 horsepower, natural gas. When we expanded our glass greenhouse uh, back in 2011, we added this boiler as well. So we have backup boilers um, on standby, um, but this is the main one. We collect uh, CO2 off the back, the flue gas. We have a condenser here in the back, it cools down the flue gas before it exits and, uh, and ends up uh, getting pushed into the greenhouses. It's our central manifold, so all of our pumps are connected here and they push water uh, wherever it needs to go. Uh, those of you who are familiar with greenhouses, we you've probably seen these around uh, Canada, buffer tanks outside, so they're connected to our heating system. This one is, it's uh, 700 cubic meters and it's full of water all the time. But uh, the point is to conserve energy. So mainly in the summer when uh, we need CO2 for our crops, the boiler runs for CO2. But in the summertime, a lot, of, a lot of days we don't need the extra heat that it makes. So all that hot water heats up this tank during the day, during our CO2 dosing period. And then at night, uh, when when uh, we don't, the plants don't need CO2, then all the hot water from this tank can be used in the greenhouse. So it, the delivery system uh, grabs the hot water from this tank and moves it back into the greenhouse so it saves on uh, running the boiler during the nights. You can see the diffused glass here. That's the point of this picture, I guess, is uh, you can't see the sun and the plants can't feel the sun either directly. So it uh, brings in the light at, at different angles and it brings in the light deeper into the crop. So it hits more leaves. Uh, I'll point out a few other things here too. We have yellow sticky traps. Um, we have a full-time scout we employ. So part of his job is to uh, check these traps and um, order beneficial bugs to be preventative so uh, we can avoid outbreaks as much as we can um, with various pests like aphids and whitefly and thrips and spider mite. Uh, we always try to bring in good bugs before uh, problems happen. And uh, it's a very valuable position that we have. And uh, Dorian, our scout, is, is really good at what he does. Uh, this is a picture of a, a vertical fan uh, that we use. So we, because this greenhouse is taller, it's seven meters from the floor to the gutters. Uh, with the lights on, there's a lot of heat that they create. So these fans help bring, there's one every 500 square meters, and these fans help bring the hot air down to the, below the gutter systems so that uh, we have a more even climate from top to bottom and we can use that uh, hot air, especially when we're not venting uh, in the wintertime. Uh, this is a picture of one of our grow scales. So we have a certain amount of plants on scales and they're connected to our computer system and we have these load cells, one on each side that uh, way so we can tell when there's been an irrigation cycle and we can see how much it's um, dried down in between cycles and during the night we can see how much water the plants have consumed and, and during the day in between cycles so it's another tool we can use to uh, for our irrigation strategy we have energy saving screens as well. So at every truss, we have bunched up fabric. We have a blackout screen in the back. We have two screens on the glass houses, uh, one in the plastic houses. And the, the purpose of these are, uh, well, this blackout is a double purpose one. It also blocks light out to the atmosphere, but it's an energy saving screen. So it closes from truss to truss. And it's like a blanket that can close over the crop when it's cold out so we don't have to heat up as much above in, in the peaks of the greenhouse. Irrigation system, we have three different pump sets currently. Uh, stock tanks of fertilizer, we get uh, lab results from our drain water every week. It's really important for us. 
to know uh, what the plants are using so we can adjust our recipes accordingly. Um, I didn't get a good picture of our recirculation system, but on, on top of this mezzanine, there's a pasteurizer and we collect all of our, all of our recirc water and reuse it into our fresh water batches um, so we don't waste any fertilizer or water. Uh, this is an example of a slide. We, we get monthly uh, reports from, uh, we work with the energy consultant as well, 360 Energy out of Ontario, and they help us with our uh, procurement strategies. So if we want to sign up for a contract with our gas and power, we are talking to them and they're helping us negotiate uh, good contracts giving us advice on uh, the energy market in Alberta, you know, if they anticipate that there'll be coal plants shutting down in the future or um, new wind generation, um, and they've helped us with carbon tax initiatives. And um, yeah, so this is an example of an energy report. It's a monthly report, one of the reports we go through. So they go over our bills, they make sure our bills are accurate with our suppliers, and they give us, uh, Kind of a nice way of um, sharing, uh, showing our data to us of so what we've consumed, so we can help make that can help us make good decisions in the future. It's a picture of our family. Um, it's a couple of years old. There's, I think, a few more kids, <laughs> grandkids now. Not all of us are involved in the day to day. Most of us are. Um, it's a benefit of working uh, with family as well. The, uh, the grandkids. Uh, Love hanging out at the greenhouse, and um, yeah, it's uh, it's a good time. Not family businesses aren't for everybody, I understand, uh, but we've made it work, and uh, we we know what buttons not to push, and we can, uh, yeah, we know uh, that we all have our best interests in mind. We have certain areas uh, that we kind of work in in a greenhouse, and uh, yeah, we have regular meetings and updates, and talk with our crop and our energy consultants to make uh, good decisions. This is my final screen of the presentation. I'll just go through a couple more challenges and successes here. I have notes on. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll just go through some of the challenges we've experienced or are currently experiencing. Uh, one challenge is the increasing input costs. So minimum wage is increasing and uh, yeah, the carbon tax has come in. It's uh, jumped up again this month. But we're also thankful for the rebate program in place in our province. And uh, I know our industry has lobbied hard, the AGGA, to um, to get this carbon tax and uh, rebate in place. And we're thankful for that. And another challenge is always new pests and diseases that pop up um, that we aren't anticipating. Um, there's always new things that we're dealing with and, and current pests that we have to prepare for. And also with the... Uh, in the winter, especially the crazy conditions, uh, you know, minus 30 one day and then within a day and a half at zero and uh, you're always looking at your settings and babysitting the greenhouse and making sure that the humidity is in check and uh, the heat set points and the boiler and uh, in the summer too when uh, it's plus 25 or plus 30, then you're always looking at your irrigation systems and making sure that they're up to par. Uh, because things can go wrong in extreme temperatures and we live in a province with a lot of extremes. So that's a challenge for us. And um, success is uh, one of our successes has been a variety of our crops. Um, most greenhouses our size are a lot bigger than us would grow maybe one or two crops max. So they can really optimize production and we try to optimize as well. But um, the benefit of our marketing channels is we can grow a variety of crops and sell them for pretty good prices um, directly to our customers at farmers markets. So that's why we grow a few rows of hot peppers and a few rows of uh, long pointed peppers and striped eggplant and a, just a variety of different things. So we can, uh, yeah, on our tables at our farmers markets, we can um, have a nice variety of products. And I mentioned earlier, uh, success is uh, working with family. Um, yeah, and seeing uh, my kids, my oldest is in grade seven, and uh, she's showing an interest in working at farmer's markets, and uh, it's kind of a nice uh, way to uh, get your kids more involved. It's uh, That's how I grew up, and uh, yeah, I can see that happening now with our second generation, a third generation, actually. 
And uh, another uh, benefit is with farmers markets is uh, appreciative customers. Um, you know, middle of January right now, and we're at a farmers market in Edmonton, and a lot of comments about, oh, there's not too much in the stores right now for quality, and uh, our stuff is maximum one or two days old on the shelves. And uh, appreciative customers is is a benefit uh, for farmers markets and growing uh, in the winter time with lights. So. Um, Dustin, that kind of wraps up my PowerPoint, and uh, maybe if there's any questions from anybody, I could uh, take those now. Sure. Okay. We've got a uh, we've got a few here. So you talked about um, all of your ranges are lit except for the one that you've got peppers in currently, correct? Yeah. So nine of our eleven acres have lights. So our original block, the oldest house, it's the shortest, and uh, so it. To put lights in there is a bit tricky when our crops get older um, because they get a little bit close to the lights especially the hps lighting it can get pretty hot um, so uh, that's uh, yeah that's just a traditional pepper crop okay um, and you guys do grow a number of different crops do you want can you maybe talk about how you rotate those crops through the houses at all or yeah so we have four different uh, climate areas that we can control with our computer so they're separated by you know internal walls and heating system different heating systems and irrigation systems so um, we always like i said earlier we gear up our uh, production schedule around our lighting program so we're always you know with the lighting area the lit areas we are planting in the summer so we want to be maximizing our production in the winter time at this time of the year to get the most product out we can um, when we can get, uh, when we can hopefully achieve the highest prices. So, in all the lit areas, we're replanting uh, in the summer, and then the phase one area where there's no lights, uh, where it's a traditional crop. So, like most other greenhouses, they're just planting their brand new crops right now, or they have uh, a few weeks ago. So, uh, yeah, and what determines our what ratio of different crops to grow? Uh, we've had this ratio somewhat for the last four or five years and uh, our buyers have gotten used to it a bit and uh, it also depends on disease pressures if we can if have it a hard having a hard time growing a certain crop in one area we might switch it out to a new crop in a different area so there's always uh, yearly decisions to make on what what to grow and how much of it to grow for sure you guys were one of the one of the first ones dealing with um cucumber green model mosaic virus do you maybe want to chat about how you how you've dealt with that and and kind of how you've grown with that yeah so it was about four years ago we found some funny looking plants so we got them tested and uh, found out we got CG MMV and uh, so we you know, over the last few years we've tried different methods to try to get rid of it um, and then there was one point where we, where we thought well maybe we have to grow less cucumbers and just kind of deal with it as we go um, when we first started out, cucumbers under lights, we were interplanting the whole time. So we would start up a new crop in the same area before the old crop was moved out. And that worked for a while, but yeah, pest pressures kept increasing and uh, disease pressures kept increasing because we were really pushing the crops really hard. Um, you know, bugs, for example, would, trips would jump over from the old crop to the new crop. So um, we've had to have a few breaks in production along the way to clean up more. And we've looked at new protocols for cleaning out. And this latest protocol we've had from a Dutch company has been working for us. And we haven't had virus in the last two crops. So uh, it's a success story. And uh, But yeah, we've had less production because, or more production gaps, I should say. Uh, the crops have been healthier. So we're overall, the whole year, we're still producing a good amount of kilograms per square meter. But um, there's more gaps now, for sure. Okay. Um, the snow that's, I mean, you are a gutter connect. So how, how do you manage snow load in the gutters there? Are, do you have heat running up under there or? Yeah, we have, uh, some, uh, pipes that are right underneath the gutter and we'll turn them on if we have to. We haven't had to yet this year. It doesn't make too much snow, but, um, the gutters are, or the whole structure is engineered for this snow load. So whoever engineered it when we ordered the greenhouse package, uh, knew that we were going to build it in central Alberta. So they historically looked at snow load averages. And uh, so it's designed for a certain amount of weight on the roof. Okay. Um, I've got a question. Why did you decide to go with glass for the last two phases? 
Yeah, we jumped from double poly, so two sheets of plastic, right, to diffused glass. Uh, we didn't ever have clear glass. Um, we do get hailstorms from time to time, so it was a big decision for us to make. Um, one of the reasons we went with glass is we got a uh, pretty attractive federal grant, um, basically an interest-free loan as part of our financing package because it was new technology at the time to Canada. So, um, yeah, so we, uh, that was a big factor in us deciding to, to invest in glass. And yeah, with diffused glass, we believe strongly at the time, it was still a pretty new concept, diffused versus clear. Now I think most greenhouses are building diffused glass from what I hear, if they are uh, building with glass. Um, but yeah, at the time with the diffused glass, we thought that it would really help our high wire cucumber crops by redirecting and and uh, yeah, making light go deeper into the canopy of the crop so we could uh, gain on production. But we haven't had a good case study from clear glass to diffused glass of what the benefits were for us, but um, we've heard from other growers that yeah, diffused glass is, uh, is a good option. Um, it, I'm not sure what the price is these days, but I know it's gone down quite a bit. Do you do you find between the plastic and and the glass? Do you find um, better ability to control your climate with one versus the other, or or a difference in your climate? Yeah, with the, the two sheets of plastic on the roof of our uh, older houses, yeah, it, um, you can capture a lot more heat. So, right, we only have one energy saving screen in the plastic houses. If we had two, um, it would probably get too hot underneath, and uh, Obviously, the glass lets more light in, so um, we had to get tempered glass as well, so the sheets aren't as wide and they're hardened for the for the hail damage that could potentially occur. And um, yeah, so we thought that. Well, and then every four or five years, we're we're stripping these plastic sheets off too, so there's a lot of extra labor. Um, some guys might go longer, but you're losing a lot of light as well as you go as you and the plastic could get more brittle, so. In a windstorm or a hailstorm, uh, you know it's a little bit more risky to have older plastic. So we try to resheet our poly houses every four years. I think we're due again this summer. Yes, I've heard rumors that you guys are the uh, the experts in reskinning a greenhouse. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on the wind. I mean, if there's no wind, we got guys that could uh, do it. Except I'm getting older, so <laughs> <laughs> it hurts more when you fall, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, I've got a question here about how, proximity to your greenhouse. How much, how often do you find that you're, uh, you know, that you're running out there in the middle of the night, the night for alarms or anything like that? When it was minus 30 in between Christmas and New Year's, um, we, our main boiler went down. So we, uh, it was down for about two hours. It was a, actually turned out to be a setting issue in our computer system. So we had to fire up our backup boilers and we were on the, on the phone with a, the guy who commissioned our boilers, he's out of Vancouver. And uh, that's part of what he does is troubleshoot over the phone. So we went through our manual and looked at the electrical schematics and uh, kind of figured out it was a computer setting. So we changed that and it's been good. Um, but yeah, we're on call. There's We have a dial out system. So we have four phone numbers inputted. So between the four of us owners, um, our cell phones are all on there and we have a uh, an app we can connect to the greenhouse computer with so we're always connected um, whenever we have internet access we can log in and check out uh, the computer system and and fix a lot of the alarms but obviously there's some alarms where you have to be here and and figure it out especially when the extreme temperatures hit if it's minus 30 or plus 30 you got to be uh, you know confident in your irrigation and heating systems so, so is are like is there are one of you ticketed or or you're constantly relying on like an outside boiler maker or somebody to service it? Uh, I have my fourth class power engineering. Uh, we had steam boilers for a while, so uh, and now we're above a certain a certain heating capacity that we need a fourth class on site. So I took my course uh, six or seven years ago, um, but I'm, we're not experts in a lot of the equipment on site so we rely heavily on our electrician and our local plumber and you have to have good trades in the area um, that you rely on that know your farm that know your electrical panels that know where parts are in a pinch and uh, you know that's huge to rely on uh, 
the the trades or the people who know what uh, you know we 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 know somewhat how to grow plants, but um, at our size, we have to focus on growing maybe more than someone who's more of a hobby farmer. And um, so yeah, it, it's kind of a different uh, mentality, I guess. Hmm. How much you said you have a backup boiler there? How many like how much duplication do you have in your system? How many things do you have doubles of? I guess. Um, double. Well, we like for our irrigation systems, we have three separate ones. So we have one recipe mix for our tomatoes, one for our peppers, one for our cucumbers. And but all those three are connected at the headers, so we can valve. Like if one pump goes down, we can revalve and repipe. Don't don't have to repipe, but just open up valves so that we can bypass certain areas and uh, double up on a certain irrigation. A few irrigation valves here and there if we have to, and yeah. So basically, irrigation and heating. We have a backup generator as well for emergency power. We don't have it big enough, obviously, to run our lights. We have, over, I think, five and a half megawatts here of lighting. So, you know, just the backup generator is just for emergency power, like irrigation and and uh, boilers. So, um, and then we have parts sitting around. Uh, we have a lot of different things sitting around. Uh, you know, our irrigation pump, our well pump from our our surface pond pump, we have double. So, yeah, hmm. it, it in order to grow year round, I mean, we, we can't really be down too long at all. Like some guys might try to run with a piece of equipment knowing they'll be down for a month or two when they can fix it and they don't have to uh, have the pressure of growing plants. But with growing year round, uh, you need to have, yeah, reliable equipment, obviously. I think there's that added complication of your you are completely that plant's completely dependent on you in that greenhouse structure, right? Like there's no rain, there's no you know what I mean? Like there you have to be able to provide that or you don't have a crop. Yeah. Yeah, and obviously um, our, our insurance company requires a lot of backups too. So for sure, um, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You you said you're sending away weekly for um for analysis on on your drain water there do you notice like from year to year in the same crop do you notice similarities in in one week or another like you know that it's going to be taking more more in at this point or is it always a, a mixed bag depending on sunlight and temperature and whatnot at this time of year even if you can get a nice sunny day but the light levels are so uh low still there's not much intensity the angle of the sun is so low that not much light ends up in the greenhouse so our irrigation program is pretty stable up until end of March, April, then the sun, you can start to feel it and it, the plants start to use more. You can see it on the scales there in between irrigation cycles there. Uh, you know, there's uh, more usage of water, more evaporation as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, you never want to set put settings on cruise control. Sometimes we're, we've been accused of that and that's why, you know, a, crop consultant can come in every 10 or 12 days and help us look at our crops, look at our settings, make sure everything is uh, good to go. And if you're here every day, sometimes you, you miss things and um, things become, you, know, you walk past them or you don't notice things. So it's good to have uh, an extra set of eyes from time to time just to ask good questions, right? That actually leads into uh, the next question quite nicely. You guys are running a Priva? for your control system correct yeah we've run priva for as long as i've been here full-time about 18 years and um, yeah i know there's other systems out there but i don't have any experience with them and how, how much like with that with that system what aspects what aspects of the production does it actually control oh every, i mean you can get different packages depending on what you need but like it controls our heating, our irrigation, our venting, our CO2. I mean, it, it does everything. Like there's sensors in the crop for humidity and uh, CO2 sensors. So yeah, it, it everything is controlled by the Priva. So you talked about putting it on putting it on cruise control there. How much how much babysitting do you find it actually needs, or is it or could it be relatively self sufficient or yeah, it depends on the day again. And if uh, you have a faulty boiler like we did, or um, you have a pump set that's not working 
properly or plugging up or um you know there's or a vent motor goes down um there's always things that can happen um if a day like if you see a long-term forecast and it's not going to change too much like if the next few days here it's supposed to be around one degree for a high and uh, pretty consistent from day to day that's when it's a little bit easier to manage because you know what to expect but when you have changes in temperatures and uh, wind and sun and all these things uh that's when you have to kind of go in there and make sure you're hitting your averages your your target temperatures or um yeah your humidity levels aren't too high or too low and yeah so you're always uh checking things out hmm. um so the challenges that you kind of laid out there um at the end how many of those like do you feel like any of those are more um more relevant to just you guys or are they kind of industry-wide or, or what are some challenges that you specifically are facing? Yeah, those challenges are industry-wide. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if we have any specific challenges that are different than most other growers. Um, you know, everybody has to heat a greenhouse in the winter and everybody needs access to water um, for irrigation concerns and uh, yeah. Um, not everybody has a family farm, so that's something unique to us. And not everybody does direct marketing like we do. So, I mean, uh, yeah, there's challenges to that too, and there's more work involved. Uh, you're busy on a weekend, and uh, you have more trucking, you have more bagging of products on on site. Um, yeah, so there's always uh, with direct marketing, there's always extra um, work, but the benefits are are still there for us. And do you, do you find, have you found over, um, I guess over the development and building of the business, have you found that there's a point where those problems start to get less? Was there a size where you noticed fewer problems or has it always just been there's, there's always enough problems to go around? <laughs> well, I wish, yeah, if we grew 50 acres, uh, no, but it, it's just compounded. Uh, I could see if we grew less variety of crops, that would be less of a headache because we, have these different crops in different areas. So they require different irrigation strategies, different climates, different uh, vent strategies, um, different pruning techniques for our staff. So I'm sure we're sacrificing top production uh, to get these variety of crops. So, um, you know, if we were to get bigger, it would probably be more of one crop because I think, um, yeah, for us to expand our farmers markets and have more variety, it would be uh yeah it would be a bit of a challenge so if we were to expand it almost be easier in a sense that we would know it would be one crop we could really optimize the climate and the irrigation and um those other aspects of growing and really gear for top production we we strive for that here as well but with the variety of crops there's it it's just uh quite a bit more management do you have any idea like what kind of production you're sacrificing by not um, aiming for peak production, but more that that diversified production and, and quality? Well, you hear stories of guys growing light uh, lit tomatoes, for example, and they're getting like 100 kg per square meter or something. But yeah, we're not near that. Um, We've, we've hit good production in our cucumbers. Uh, that's our largest area of growing and it's in our glass house. And uh, so we pay quite a bit of attention to that crop and it grows really fast compared to our, cu our tomatoes and peppers. So uh, we put a lot of focus in those cucumber crops. Um, so we can get comparable production to most guys, I think, in the cucumbers. Um, and then with our lit program, we're, we're growing a lot of our about half of our peppers are under lights and uh you know we're, we're hoping for the good prices in the winter especially at our farmers markets and local markets in central alberta so but we're not getting top production like you would in uh june july august you know when you get a lot of light and uh obviously there's more input costs in the winter too with the, the lower temperatures outside Okay. And then when you like when we when you're talking about the varieties that you view that you grow and whatnot, how often do you change those, and how often do you 
uh, how, like how do you pick new ones, I guess? What do you base it on? Um, sometimes customers request, you know, why aren't you growing uh, pickling cucumbers or melons or strawberries? Or we've tried a few of those things. Uh, we used to grow strawberries in our lettuce area. Um, that didn't turn out too well. We, our variety choice maybe was poor and, um, yeah, we were growing on concrete floors and the climate was a bit of an issue. And, uh, yeah, we've tried different things from time to time. But you have staple crops that, you know, will perform pretty good because we have a track record with them. So we don't steer away too much from growing too large of an area. The nice thing with, with farmer's markets that we, we do, we can do a few tests, trial, like trialing, with certain new uh, striped eggplant or white eggplant, for example. And But it's only one or two rows of this and one or two rows of that. And, um, you know, we're not taking a huge leap into three acres of striped eggplant or something. You know, it, it's just uh, the nice thing with direct marketing is you can try a few things here and there. Hmm. Okay. I think that looks like we don't have any more questions. So if there aren't any further questions, I'll let you know that the recording for the webinar will be available uh, at www.agriculture.alberta.ca slash horticulture uh, later on. Um, an evaluation for the webinar a lot will uh, come along with the recording um, and that'll automatically be sent to you tomorrow. And your feedback is always appreciated as it does help us tailor programming to what you need and what you wanna hear. And so once again, thanks to Eric for a wonderful presentation. And thanks to all of you who took time out of your busy day to listen. We hope you'll enjoy, we hope you'll join us again in a couple of weeks on January 29th. And we'll have Dawn Below from Sunrise Organic Gardens. And she's going to be talking about their use of season extension techniques to make their operation more profitable. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.